I've done several videos on doing TDR, or time domain reflectometry, to measure things like the length of coax, or measure its velocity factor, or even characteristic impedance. And I used uh, little pulse generators, either you know a signal generator like this guy over here, or uh, these little homebrew fast edge pulse generators like this one I made here, or this little circuit board from my friend uh, EA5 IGC. And along with your digital scope, you can get a plot like this and use that to determine you know, these various parameters. But it turns out you can actually do that with just the scope without using any of these circuits, and it's really simple. Let's uh, take a look at how. Now here's our super simple TDR setup. Uh, you've got a digital scope, and a simply a 9 volt battery, maybe a couple of clip leads, and a resistor, 50 ohms, 100 ohms, uh, value is not terribly important, you just want it to be relatively close to the impedance of the line you're trying to measure. A little T to connect uh, to uh, your little 9 volt battery and then to the unknown length of line that you want to measure. And the simple idea is set up the scope to be either in single shot or normal trigger and uh, adjust the trigger level so that it's up, up above the baseline and simply touch the end of the resistor to the 9 volt battery. That creates a step voltage change which then propagates down the line, reflects off the end and then comes back and you can actually see the injection to the line and the uh, reflection coming back and use that to measure your parameters. Now the basic setup for the scope is uh, your DC coupling, the input, uh, and if you're using a 9 volt battery, 1 or 2 volts uh, per division so that uh, your full 9 volts will appear on screen. And then uh, set the position down near the bottom so that uh, you start off down here at ground and then your 9 volts kind of goes up that way. Now your horizontal settings really going to depend a lot on the length of the line you're trying to measure so you'll have to adjust this accordingly but typically maybe five nanoseconds per division for the shortest lines like a couple of feet long up to maybe 50 or 100 nanoseconds uh, per division or maybe longer for really long lines uh, maybe up to 100 feet or more uh, and then the trigger position you want to set that near 10 percent meaning kind of close to the you know, left edge of the display so you can see the waveform play out towards the end. And the triggering, as I mentioned, uh, you really want to trigger obviously on the signal that you're uh, using. Uh, DC coupled, rising edge, about a 2 volt threshold, and then again the normal or single mode so that you only get a trace when the uh, signal actually transitions. Yeah, so here's the simple setup. You've got our BNCT right here. It's connecting right to the scope. Scope's in one mega ohm termination impedance. Our connection from this point forward will go to our unknown line. And from here, I just have a little BNC to clip lead adapter. And one end connected to the 9 volt battery, the other end connected to a resistor. And we're simply going to make connection like that and generate our waveforms. And so I've got uh, some coax connected at the far end of my BNCT here. And all I need to do is hit it. And of course, if I hit it a couple of times, I can get kind of all messed up here. So the idea is in normal trigger mode, just do it until you get a nice clean waveform. Once we've got that clean waveform, we can count divisions if you don't have cursors on your scope. Or if you've got cursors, you can actually position those cursors so that they're about on the same point of the waveform, you know, on the initial step and on the reflected step. And once you've got that, you can then measure the delta T, in this case, my delta T is 47.8 nanoseconds. That's the delta between those two cursors. So once you've got that delta T, we can then go ahead and compute uh, the length of that line. And uh, so we start off by, we need to know the speed of light. And for measuring the length of line, it's usually helpful to express it in either feet or meters, depending on your preference. So the speed of light uh, in feet per nanosecond is 0.9836 feet per nanosecond at or 0.2998 meters per nanosecond. Then we also have to know the velocity factor uh, for the particular cable or coax or transmission line or whatever that we're measuring. Typical values for coax will range from you know, maybe 66% for like RG58 uh, up to 85% or even sometimes a bit faster for some other types of coax. And we can even uh, take a look at using you know, measuring twisted pair like ethernet cable. I'll show you that here in a moment. You can usually look up that velocity factor online uh, just by the model number of the, the cable, or you can go ahead and estimate it. Or if you've got a chunk of cable, you can physically measure it and then back calculate uh, to what the velocity factor is. Again, I've got uh, a video on that as well, and I'll link some of those videos down below. 
Now I express these speed of light values in distance per nanosecond for a reason because most cases you're going to be measuring that delta T in nanoseconds. So this just makes it convenient. Okay, so we take that delta T in nanoseconds and remember that's the round trip time. It's the time it took this injected signal to go down the line, hit the end, and then come back to the scope. So it's really twice the delay through the cable. Again, if we take that value in nanoseconds and simply multiply it by our speed uh, in feet or meters per nanosecond, multiply by the velocity factor, so if it's 66%, this would be 0.66. And because it's the round trip, we divide by 2. And that quite simply will give me the length of the line. So in this case, we measured a delta T of 47.8 nanoseconds. Uh, we multiply that by, let's say, 0.9836. That is the feet per nanosecond, multiplied by 0.66, which is the velocity factor of the RG58, and divide that by 2, and I get 15 and a half feet. And I measured about uh, just a little over 15 feet on this cable, so that's pretty darn close. I've got a box of Cat5e Ethernet cable that I used to uh, wire my house here about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And I've got some unknown length left in the box. So let's uh, apply this same measurement technique to figure out how much cable I got left in here. And so I took off the unknown coax that I was measuring here, replaced it with another set of BNC to clip leads, and I'm just going to uh, measure the blue twisted pair here. So we'll just connect up uh, to those two leads right there, and we'll go hit it with the 9 volt step. There we go. Well, looks like I don't have the time scale set up long enough to see the end of the cable, so those 20 nanoseconds per division wasn't quite enough. So let's slow it down. Oh, there it is right there. So at 100 nanoseconds per division, I can actually see that return echo. All right, so let's move our second cursor here to be on the, uh, just on that, where that echo returns back. And we can see our delta T, 265.8 nanoseconds. Okay, so let's take our 265.8 nanoseconds and multiply by, let's com compute it in feet here again, 0.9836. And then I've seen uh, velocity factors for twisted pair cable like this Ethernet cable ranging from about 64% to 74%. So let's go midway between those two at 0.69 or 69%. And then divide by 2. And that tells me I've got just a little over 90 feet of this Cat5e cable left. Now it turns out this cable actually has every couple of feet the remaining uh, distance left in it. And we can see from this end I've got uh, 90 feet from this point back into the box, so just a little over 90 feet of cable. Now one more fun experiment, and I wasn't sure this was going to work until I tried it. Uh, this is just a, an old spool of heavy duty speaker wire or just typical zip cord. And I thought that uh, because this was all neatly wound that it'd get too much coupling from line to line for this to work, but it turns out it actually works. Let's go take a look. And let's go uh, trigger it and catch, catch a sweep. Well, it looks like I need to speed the scope up a little bit to get better resolution here. Now let's grab another one. And let's position our cursors here kind of on the about the 10% of that rising edge. And let's go grab uh, the other edge here. And we can see my delta T is about 62.6 .6 nanoseconds. Now I've done some experiments and found that um, the velocity factor of zip cords like this is typically pretty slow, about 60% or so. So if we run those numbers, we wind up getting a length of about 18 and a half feet, and that's probably about right. I'm not going to unspool all of this to see if that's what's there, but uh, that looks reasonable. Now you may have noticed that uh, for both the uh, Ethernet cable and this cable here, that second step isn't as big as the first step. And that's because I didn't change the value of the resistor. I'm still using about a 50 ohm resistor. So because the impedance of uh, these other lines was larger, I wasn't get a, getting as much of a voltage division uh, during that initial surge. So I could increase that resistor value to like 100 ohms to make these two steps equal, but it really isn't necessary in order to make the measurements. So you might ask, could I use the same technique to measure the length of just a single conductor, uh, like I've got on this spool of wire here? The answer, unfortunately, is no. In order for this technique to work, we need to essentially have a pair of conductors, not a single conductor. And that pair of conductors needs to have a pretty constant physical relationship to establish kind of a constant distributed inductance and capacitance leading to a relatively constant impedance. So same thing with coax, we've got a single line and the shield and that establishes the impedance of that line. Uh, with the twisted pair wire that we were using here, 
The twists between the wires keeps a constant distance between those wires and a constant coupling between those wires, so we get a relatively constant impedance, in this case about 100 ohms. And then even like the zip, link, uh, zip wire that we're using here, the physical relationship between the two conductors is consistent. So we need really that pair of conductors, and that's why it won't work with just a single conductor like this spool. Right, so I hope you enjoyed this video, a really super simple and quick way of doing a TDR measurement with your digital scope, a 9 volt battery, a pair of clip leads, and a resistor. Uh, the notes that I've uh, shown in this video will be available in a link uh, down below. I'll also link in a couple of my previous videos on the theory of TDR so you can get a little more background on that. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please consider doing so. And thanks again as always for watching. We'll see you next time.